the name's Bond. James Bond. To infinity and beyond! I am Iron Man. I can do this all day. To God of I feel the need. The need for speed. Toto? I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Good morning, TWC. Hey, guys, I just wanted to explain something to you. We've had some comments, and we've had some stuff that's come up where, where we've asked, well, Javi wasn't, Pastor Javi wasn't wearing the same thing. And so we have been recording separately for you guys because of copyright issues of showing any type of clips. So we just want you to know, online campus, we care that much about you. So we are so excited. I hope that you guys have enjoyed this, this series. This has been really fun. If you are joining us online, do me a favor. Type in your favorite movie. Pastor Javi's gonna wanna know that that's him too, so you just make sure. I know, I know you guys are excited, but we are excited as well that Pastor Todd will be back next week. Yay, everybody's so thrilled. So what this is gonna bring is he's gonna bring this new series about the second coming of Christ. And this is gonna be one of those things that, that challenges you, that brings you awareness, that doesn't bring fear, but brings hope and, and brings an urgency to get ready, for you to get ready and for you to get as many others ready as possible. So I don't know why, but the Lord speaks to me in animation. So maybe it's the years of kids' ministry. I, I don't know, but, but we got done watching Top Gun Maverick, and I was like, man, that was a really good movie. And Dijon was like, did you see all of, the, all of the powerful things that the Lord was speaking? And I was like, no, it was a really good movie. And she was like, listen to this, 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 this. And I was like, uh, okay, wow, all right. So there it, there it was. So in animation movies and cartoons, I normally hear the same thing. So I, I love these movies. And it was a really hard choice to choose the movie that I chose. And so the movie that I chose was, was Wally, but I had a hard time not doing Inside Out. Inside Out is one of my favorite movies because it teaches you about how important it is for you to be in touch with, with, with every single aspect of who you are. And, and these core memories that happen in your life will define you and shape you and you react and respond to people outside of these core memories. So if these core memories aren't brought to the Lord, how dangerous that is for you to navigate life without a saved and sanctified imagination and mind because then you will walk in thinking the worst about every single person because of your previous experiences. So that one was hard for me not to do. And then I loved Meet the Robinsons. I, I don't know if you've ever seen Meet the Robinsons, but it's one of my favorite movies. But it's really challenging to watch because in the beginning, the, the little guy, he starts, he starts making marks of all the families that don't accept him. And it's so hard, it's so, so gut-wrenching to see that the things that that were so special about him were, were character marks on him. And so he started struggling with that. And then the bad guy, the villain in the movie, he, what it comes down to is in the beginning, he had a misunderstanding about the way that he was treated. So it's a lot of the same thing. What happens in your childhood, if it doesn't ever get healed or redeemed, will carry out into your future. It'll carry out into, into your adulthood and it, it will shape the way that you treat other people. It will even change you into a villain because hurt people hurt people but healed people healed people. And so whenever you get healed, it changes everything. And so that's our goal for you. So those meant a lot to me, but the Lord spoke to me and said, listen, those would be easier for you to speak. Those would be easier for you to communicate. Those would be easier for you to walk into communicating about that with people. But I have a word for them. I have a word for the people. And, and I had to make a choice of, do I be obedient to that or do I try to stay in comfort? And comfort. And that's one of the points in the message. So it really makes sense. Are you all okay with being challenged of your normal being challenged a little bit? Yes. Amen. All right. So if you are a note taker, the title of this message would be called Don't Take the Bait. All right. So Wally. So the beginning scene of Wally is, is this, they do a pan view of what the earth looks like now. And there are skyscrapers next to piles of trash. There are, there's, there's this big, huge junk piles everywhere all around the earth, and there's no life, and there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of turmoil, and then you see this little robot running around, and he's cleaning up the mess, and he's, and he's doing this. And so you see what had happened to the earth, 
and you see what, what was going on with this excess. And so the first lesson that we learn about from Wally is, is it, this teaches us about counterfeits. There's two counterfeits that culture tries to sell us. One, this is the first one, you need more stuff to truly be happy. We're constantly chasing the new thing, right? We're constantly chasing what, what is the next best thing that comes out? What, it, what is something that, that we have to have, but we haven't even utilized the things that we do have. You know, you know, one of the big lessons or big things that we teach at with our, with our church and with our staff is stewardship. If you're not using what you have, then why do you want something different? Can you, can you shift the things that you do have to do better than the ways, than just buying something new? And so what's happened is, is, guys, I need you to know this movie starts and it looks like it's like a green initiative project and I'm not gonna talk to you guys about that, okay? This isn't a save the world thing. This is, this is save our soul. This is save our heart. This is save our mind type of message, okay? So here's, here's the deal about that that's crazy. Storage buildings are one of the fastest growing industries in the world right now especially in America. In America, since 2012, it has had 7% growth each year, and the trend is still going up. Storage buildings revenue was at 30 billion in 2020. It is projected to be at 56 billion in 2026. That is insane. So when, when Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust may destroy, and where thieves may break in and steal, but lay for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys what thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Luke 12, 15, or actually 15 through 21, and he said, and he said to them, take care and be on your guard against covetousness, for one's life does not consist of abundance of his possessions. And then he told the parable of saying, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and I will build larger barns. And there I will store all of my grains and my goods. And then I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night at your soul will be required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So the one, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself is not rich towards God. So instead of realizing how to distribute wealth, instead of realizing how to distribute the things that he does have, he wanted to store up more for himself. And, and, and what the Lord said to him is your days are, are numbered. You don't have each day to just be able to count and depend on. And you can't, take, you can't take pride in your possessions. He took comfort in his possessions. He said, soul, you can relax now. You have your stuff. You have protection. You have that. So, so in that, what I love next about the Lord, it's like he knows what he's doing or something whenever he writes the Bible. The very next section of scripture is about anxiety. And it's about how you don't need to be anxious about anything. And so whenever you realize that, he's saying, don't make stuff be the thing that makes you less anxious. You have to be in a place of obedience. And then you have the story of the rich man, the rich young ruler. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came down running up, running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. Only, good is only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, you must not cheat on anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I have obeyed all of the commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all of your possessions, give it to the poor, and, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Then amazed, this amazed them. 
But Jesus said, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. And Jesus looked upon them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God, everything is possible. The rich young ruler had done everything right. He was taught from a very young age to do the right things and, and he had done it. He had walked this out and he had made sure that he had, he had his steps ordered and he was doing everything in line. But the Lord realized that he had taken comfort in his possessions. The Lord realized that he valued stuff on earth more than he valued the treasures in heaven. And so this is, this is a very hard line to find because yes, you're, you are called to, to give an inheritance to those that, that pass b behind you, 100%. You are called to do that. But what had happened was is this started to steal his soul. This started to steal his, his, his heart where, where he even had to walk away from Jesus with his head down because he valued stuff over obedience to the Lord. Valuing stuff over Jesus will cost you eternity. I mean, I, I think you can realize this. The investment trade-off there is, hey, you could have stuff and a lot of stuff for 80 to 100 years. Or you could have a lot of treasure stored up for you for eternity. It makes it seem like, why, why would you even think not to do that? Because we only see what's right in front of us. So we're gonna go to the next portion of, of Wally and and one of the lines in there that, that as they're going around, they start to see what the earth looks like still. So, so Wally's running around and he, he's going around the earth and, and there's a screen that's displaying what's happening. And they said, don't worry, we'll clean up this earth while you are away. And so what they did is they put all the humans on one uh, giant spaceship. It looked like a cruise liner up in the sky. It's pretty cool. And then they show this whole all of these people, while they're gone, the earth is gonna get cleaned up and everything is gonna look right. And you get to see glimpses of what was supposed to be on the ship. And on the ship, they had families playing together. They had families engaging and, and swimming together and having a blast together and, and playing board games together and doing all of these things. And then they said, even grandma can join the fun on these amazing hover chairs. And so the grandma is, is riding around with them and and it's really, you know, they get to see that you're gonna be spending the best quality time and you get to spend it with everybody without any type of limitations. So here's the next lesson, a next counterfeit, that having fun is more important than taking responsibility. If you're faced with a responsibility that doesn't make you happy, the culture says don't do it, right? The culture says everything is, is based on your happiness, everything. So if you're not happy, then, then why are you doing it? You gotta be happy. See, that doesn't translate well because I, I'm sorry to tell you, but, but as you grow in relationships and maybe one day you get married, it's not always happy. It's not always blissful. It's not always amazing. And, and I'll even go as far to say as listen, marriage is meant to kill you. Harsh one, right? <laughs> You're saying, oh, okay, what does that mean? Marriage is meant to, to kill the things that you think it kills the you or me out of you. So you can say we, and what can I do to serve you? What, what marriage is meant to do is to create two amazing servants who are chasing after the Lord and serve one another. And whenever you do this, it changes you from having rights to responsibilities in the relationship. But that's up to you. Maybe you're faced with, a, with, you know, previously in the state of Texas, you could have been faced with the, with the option of just having an abortion if you weren't ready for that, with that responsibility. Thankfully, Lubbock made a stand and said, we're not okay with that and we're not gonna continue to be okay with that. And so you can't do it here, right? So, so they had to step out of that. Or you hear these classic lines like, you do you, follow your heart. You're, you're, this is your truth. Listen, guys, there's no... There's no such thing as your truth. There's the truth, and then there's your opinion. But there is truth, 
It's just not just your truth. You, it has to be something that's, that's over. Or, you know, like I said, you have the Rudy, follow your heart, Rudy. You know, that's, that's that whole side of, of understanding that, listen, yes, you can follow your heart if, you're, if your heart is submitted to the Lord. If it's not, then your heart is very deceitful. You know, Proverbs goes back and forth of, Trust the Lord with all of your heart, but your heart is wicked. <laughs> you know, like, well, what am I supposed to do? I don't understand. You know, but it's, it's one of those, whenever the heart is submitted to the Lord, the Lord gives you the desires of your heart because your heart is his. Or that, you know, like I said, you do you. No, no, you don't do you. You do what Christ tells you to do. Like, it's, it's called obedience. And you won't ever realize the deepest sources of fulfillment until you are on the other side of obedience, until you are on the other side of res embracing responsibility. Because whenever you do that, you take ownership of, of your responsibilities in order to make that thing work, in order to make parenting work, in order to make relationships work. It is your responsibility to be obedient to the Lord in that. John Eldridge said in, in Wild at Heart, deep in his heart, every man longs to, for a battle to fight, for an adventure to live and a beauty to rescue. C.S. Lewis says this in The Weight of Glory. He says, it would seem our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We, have half heart, we are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who goes on making mud pies and slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the, the offer of a holiday at sea. We are too, far too easily pleased. We are completely content with focusing on what's right in front of us instead of realizing that there is abundance all the way around us. Just like the rich man, we, we are okay and content with, with seeing what's right here and saying, well, I've got enough money for this. But he's saying, no, you're called to have an inheritance for many to follow, but not just a financial inheritance, but, but a spiritual inheritance and a lineage for them to chase after and them to follow. And, but if you're not ever doing it, how are they ever gonna follow you? They won't know what to follow. That's up to us. That's up to us to, to start. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joys, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith per produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be, may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We were created for so much more. We were not created to just say, I made it to church on Sunday. I did my good Christian deed. I, I even read my Bible before I went to church. You know, I was ready. I was not gonna get condemned in that message. That was not happening because I had already had a perspective shift and I had seen the Lord before I went, yes, that's amazing. Yes, you're able to do that. But don't let Sunday be the only time that you encounter the Lord. The Lord wants you to have that encounter every day. Revelation 4.1 says, After I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Whenever you allow the Lord to invite you to different places, he gives you perspective to see stuff from a higher level, from a different vantage point. Whenever you are obedient to him, he says, Hey, come up here. Let me show you something. You don't get so stuck on seeing what's right in front of you and, 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 and not embracing responsibility and letting other people clean up your mess and other people will, will take that. You know who the other people are that will have to clean up your mess? Your kids. The people that will follow you. They are the ones who get to clean up your mess. So it's your responsibility to shift. All right, so the next part of Wally. They're finally on the cruise ship. So, so how they had got on the cruise ship is, is Wally found this plant on earth. And he, and he saw this little sprout come up and, and he just thought, I'm gonna keep it. He liked, to, little Wally the robot, liked to store little, little trinkets around him. And so he got this little trinket of, of, a, of a little bud that came up and he put it in a shoe and he kept it with him. Well, what the ship had done is the ship had this ability of sending these little robots that would come down and they would come down and they would travel around the earth and then they would um, see if there was any life that had happened. And so Wally showed Ava, Ava, the, 
the little itty bitty plant. And she went, oh, and grabbed it and put it in herself. And what it did was it sent an auto response to be able to go back to the ship. So they started doing that. So they're on the ship now. Wally's chasing after. Wally is really strong for a little bitty robot. He held onto a spaceship all the way up to it. It was pretty cool from the outside. So really, really strong. So he had made it all the way up there. And then he starts going around onto the ship. And we start to see what the ship's like now. So we heard what it was about and we heard what it was supposed to be like. But whenever he got on there, everyone was on one of those hover chairs. Everyone was talking to a screen. Even right there next to another person riding with them, they're talking to a screen to each other instead of just looking at each other. They go around the spaceship and they see that even kids are being taught by robots and screens. They're telling them about the culture and they're, they're giving the alphabet for what's important and they're, and they're talking about the, the, the different things that stand for the alphabet and it's all culturalized to the ship to make sure that the ship was everything that they should know. They even had these, these little spokespeople that would pop up and say, all right, today, today the color is, is blue instead of red. And so everybody pushes a button and they change their clothes from blue to red, or yeah, from red to blue. And then Wally comes up on the ship and he accidentally bumps into people and he throws them off their plane and he knocks one guy out and he couldn't even get back onto it. He needed a helper to get back onto the hover chair. And then he bumps into a lady and he's like, hey, I need you to move. And, and she finally moves for him. And then she turned off her screen. And then she stood up and she saw all of the beauty that was on the ship. And when she saw all of the beauty that was on the ship, she also saw that there was even a pool on the ship. She was an adult and didn't even know the things that were around her. The second lesson that we, that we learned from Wally is that it teaches us that it's easy to be distracted by a screen. All right, guys, condemnation time, right? <laughs> no, listen, if conviction happens, that's okay. We welcome conviction. But don't be condemned by this message because that's not my heart because here's the deal. I struggle with it too. I struggle with being distracted by a screen while, while life is happening around me. And it's very hard because this is what our normal is. But here's the deal. We, our generation of, of 30 and up, we, we didn't have it all the way from little kids. We, we got phased into it and we're seeing this. Our children have known nothing but technology like that right in front of them. And so we have to see that this progression is happening. How much time do we spend on a screen? The average screen time statistics in 2023, globally, the people average for screen time per day is six hours and 58 minutes. Daily screen time has increased 50 minutes per day since 2013. The average American spends seven hours and four minutes looking at some type of screen. Almost half, 49% of zero to two year olds interact with smartphones. Gen Z, the average, spends nine hours of screen time per day. Listen to these just about kids. The average screen time for kids zero to two is 49 minutes per day. The average screen time for kids two to four is two and a half hours per day. The average screen time for kids five to eight is three hours or more a day. The average screen time for eight to 12 year olds is five hours a day. And the average screen time for teens is seven and a half hours a day. We are, we are searching for life around us. We're searching for likes. We're searching for affirmation. We're searching for joy whenever we actually have the real life right in front of us. We just need somebody to come along and knock us off our seat. <laughs> but you don't need it to be tragedy that makes that happen. You want it to be an act of obedience where you're willing to have the Lord speak to you about what's okay and what's normal and what's not normal and what should happen and what shouldn't happen. How much of life are we missing because we're distracted? Are we the ones that are being controlled by a screen telling us what we should do? How much are you influenced by, by the voices that are around you? How much are you, are you, are you more influenced by the voices of telling you what you should do or are you more influenced by the Lord? That, that's a hard question. 
That's a hard question because you have to figure that out. Because if not, you will be just like those people who switched from red to blue. And you won't even realize how long that took. You won't even realize how, how quickly that, that action had happened. You know how we, how we know that that's true? Because we were told how long we should stay at home and we listened, right? It happens. Romans 12, two says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. For the testing, for by that testing, you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The Lord's will is perfect for you. It is good for you. Is it acceptable for you? And it's up to you to listen to it. I like the message version of it. It says, do not become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants for, for, from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. He has so much better for you. You just have to step out of being conformed and being, being molded by the culture and saying, I want what God has for me. Whenever you do that, it changes everything. And it's not really a sacrifice. <laughs> we think it's like this big drastic sacrifice. Oh, I gotta be obedient to God. That must mean I've gotta give up everything that I want, everything that I desire. No, like he knows the desires of your heart that will feed you, that will help you grow, that will help push you into the future, that will do some amazing things for you, that will not let you waste your time. Like he's got amazing goals for you. You just have to do it. So there's another portion back on the ship and, and, and you start seeing Wally and Ava and they're, they're exploring the ship and they'd had, they had start to make this, make this path and they start to see that, that stuff's new and, and what happened was, was that lady who had gotten knocked off, her, the screen turned off, starts running around and she starts to see the ship and she's seeing everybody and she sees Wally and Ava like flying around in space and it's really cool and, and what happens is she stopped and she grabbed somebody else and she said, hey, look at this, look at this. And they turned off their screen too. And whenever they turned off the screens, they touched hands and everybody said, aw, it's so sweet. And so whenever they touched hands, they realized like, oh, there's, there's interaction again. And, and then you go to where the captain is and the captain, he, you know, he had gotten this plant and he had gotten this opportunity to see what earth was like because he didn't even know what earth was like. All he had known was the ship. That's all he had ever known. And so he was on, he was on the ship and he was trying to, to figure out what, what is earth? What is this? And so he's asking, like, what is dancing? What, what, are, what are plants? What are all of these things? And so he's discovering this. And so the third lesson that Wally teaches us is that true connection happens when we turn off the screen. True connection is on the other side of the screen. But how many of us get so frustrated whenever you're in close proximity with your spouse or with somebody else, but you're playing on your phone and that doesn't count as quality time? That's, that's very frustrating. It's very hard for me because I'm like, I am sitting right next to you. What else do you want from me? Turn off your phone and look at me and talk to me. Okay, all right, uh, we can do that. And so we, you know, like for me to truly understand that I've got to step out and I've got to understand that that's where true connection happens. She isn't fulfilled by me just texting her memes and, and funny videos and doing those things. That doesn't work. She wants to engage with me. Your kids wanna engage with you. How many times have you been sitting in a room, playing on your phone and missing the life that was happening? It, it's, it's happening quick, guys, it's happening. Here are some of the negative results of excessive screen time. Kids are being exposed to pornography at a dangerous young age. The average age of kids being exposed to pornography is nine years old. And the scary thing about this is, is this is, yes, somebody might show them. Maybe you've protected them and somebody else showed them, but here's the hard part, is 80% of those kids go back and search it again. Pornography is the enemy counterfeit to true intimacy. I don't know if you guys have seen it yet, but, but the sound of freedom speaks to this. The sound of freedom shows how quick the internet age is pushing child pornography. 
and pushing that type of agenda and how quickly it's succeeding. That, they said that in that movie, they said that is the fastest growing business in the world is child pornography. But it doesn't start with that. It starts with the other stuff, but it doesn't become satisfying anymore. And so you start reaching for more and more and more and more, and then you don't even recognize yourself anymore. You know, there's a, there's a series called Conquer that talks about porn addiction and dropping the porn addiction and how to do that. And it says, you're either holding the sword towards your family or you're holding the sword towards pornography. And whenever you're holding the swords toward your family, you're saying, I'm willing to cut you to hide the secret and protect the secret of what I'm struggling with. Or you can hold the sword to pornography and say, I don't ever want to encounter that again. And I don't want that for my family. And I don't want them to have to face it. But it's up to you to make that change. It is hard, but it's worth it. Parents are not getting enough screen or face-to-face time with their kids. I, I say this whenever we teach the baby dedication class, but 64% of parents admit to spending less than one hour a week playing with their children. 71% of those parents admit to spending 15 hours or more playing t- watching TV. The average American spends seven, 37 minutes of quality time per day with their kids. That's a stark, stark contrast between the seven hours they spend in front of a screen. We have time with your kids. We do. We all have time with our kids. We just have to leverage that time with actual beneficial time. It's up to you. You know, whenever we also say that, we have three, it's studies show whenever you take out sleeping and school and all of those things, parents have around 3,000 hours a, a, a year to leverage with their kids. So a good church attender, somebody who is very faithful, they typically get their kids to church for about 40 hours a year. But the primary responsibility for for spiritual growth is put on the church. That's just unfair, right? Like 40 hours, we're we're trying to leverage this amount of time to grow them spiritually whenever you have 3,000 hours to, to leverage that at home. Be strengthened. Get out of your chair. Get out of your comfort and realize you're responsible for leading them. Yes, we wanna help, but you're responsible. These past two parts of Wally show us that they have stopped enjoying adventure and started to crave comfort. They crave comfort so much that it, that it stopped their fight. They even lost their ability and drive to live. They, they lost their ability to be free. This even changed the way that they looked. It changed their bone structure. It changed their body. It changed everything because whenever you start seeking self-gratification, it changes you because you weren't designed for that. You were designed for a purpose. You were designed for more. But if you keep getting stuck into it, you will stay stuck there and you won't even recognize yourself when you look in the mirror anymore. We've got to step out of that craving comfort. How quickly are we seeing this today? What is every single advertisement about? How can you be comfortable? What can we do for you to make life easier? The next clip of Wally says, it starts talking about, okay, we can go home now. We can start this. We can, start to, we can start this journey. And so the captain finally has the plan again to be able to put this in, to go back to earth and to go start over again. But, but he has some interruptions in the way and, and then he sees what earth is really like right now. And he sees it isn't all the clips that he saw before. Right now it is, it's a struggle. There's dirt storms. There's trash everywhere. There's, there's skyscrapers you can't even get into. There's no houses. Everything is covered up. Everything is gonna have to get put back together. Everything is gonna have to get worked for to be able to figure out how to do this again. And the fourth lesson that you can learn from Wally is that, is that claiming what's yours is work. Claiming what's ours is work. There's a story like this in the Bible that talks about one of the youngest kings, and I think he might be the youngest king. His name was Josiah. He was eight years old whenever he became king. Like, my daughter Liv is seven, so one year up and she could go take care of the earth or take care of a nation. (laughs) That'd be fun. So he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. Like, that's pretty amazing. Like, he started at eight and he ended at 39. That's pretty cool, all right? So what had happened was was whenever he stepped in, whenever he was in his 18th year of, of leading this nation, he had realized that, that they found the book of law and, and somebody brought it to him and, and they, they found this book in the temple of the Lord and he, and he read it and he said, 
we've got to change everything. And he started repenting and he, and he started tearing down idols and, and he, t- he took down the ways that used to be and he changed everything to be able to, to fit into the way that the Lord had designed it to be. When was the last time you took the Bible personally and said, this is my responsibility to make sure that this happens in my life? It's your responsibility to change it. It's not, it's not everybody else's responsibility to clean up your mess, right? It's your responsibility to see that God has a plan for you and God has, has dreams and a destiny for you and your family, but you've got to take it personally and say, I've got to do my work. I can't just wait for him to make it, this amazing miracle happen and everything change. I've got to do my work. Our temptation for comfort must not ever replace our courage for change. You, you, you cannot stay so comfortable that you're not willing to step out and make the hard changes. You're not willing, willing to step out and, and celebrate what God is doing in your life and, and change things and, and be grateful because guys, not, you don't deserve tomorrow. We don't deserve today, but we're here. Like King Josiah, we have the power to change things, but it is work. And you have to tear down some idols and you have to tear down some structures and you have to tear down some, some beliefs and some thoughts, but it's up to you. The next clip, they, they realize, the captain realizes that it had been 700 years since they had touched earth. 700 years of generations being brainwashed more and more and more. 700 years of realizing that they weren't even in control. What they found out was that the captain had turned, the, the, the president had turned re- control over to the autopilot. And the autopilot was this wheel that went around that, that controlled everything. And this autopilot was the one who determined everything, who changed everything and, and, and made sure that they did everything. And so the autopilot was the one convincing the captain, do not go back to earth, stay here. Wally, the fifth lesson we learned from Wally is that we must turn off autopilot to start living again. Whenever he, he starts this, he, he, he has this fight in him and he says, I don't wanna survive, I wanna live. We weren't created just to survive, we were created to live a life full of abundance, full of joy. You've got to turn off this auto, autopilot. You know, whenever you're about to reach for your phone and just default first thing in the morning, say no. I will not pick up my phone without picking up the Bible. I will not pick up my phone without picking up my kids. I will not pick up my phone without, without doing what's meaningful and stepping into obedience of, of stepping out and saying, I got to learn how to live. That's up to you, guys. It's up to you. Romans 12.1 says this in the message version. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. We're gonna go into our last point. And this is a very short part of of Wally, but I feel like it's one of the most impactful parts. It's a 12-second part. And they had, they had finally accomplished what they meant to accomplish. And they got the plant back into the spot so they could, there, there was this little tube that it had to go into so they could go home. And, it, and it, as soon as they put it in there, it sent them fast. They did this hyperspeed thing all the way back to earth and they made it there and they made it to earth. But listen, guys, it's really sad, but Wally got crushed in the process and it didn't look like he was gonna make it and it was really just, broke your heart. And so he was crushed and Ava was trying to figure out how to fix him. And so in this little clip of 12 seconds, you see them finally get off the ship and they're walking funny because this had been the first time they had walked almost in their whole life. They're big and they're just taking these big steps and trying to figure out what to do. And there's these young energetic kids who still have, haven't fallen into that comfort and they're circling around the captain and the captain is going and he plants that plant back in the earth. And he said, guys, guys, we can do everything now. We're gonna clean all of this up. We're gonna do so much. We can, we can make tomato plants. We can make pizza plants. We can do all of this stuff. And, and everybody says pizza plants, you know? Like he thinks that you can do those things because he saw pizza. And so he, he didn't know what happened. 
And then you see a clip of Wally and Ava had saved Wally and everybody says, yay. But the last lesson that you learn here is that, that starting over sometimes feels weird. You might sound ignorant at times, but it's better that you just start. It takes courage to change your environment, but it takes the most courage to change the inside of us. You can move after a tragedy. You can move after pain happens. You can move after somebody hurts you. You can switch churches because the pastor didn't talk to you enough. You can, you can do all of those things and search for all of this, but I need you to understand that it's not the church's fault. It's not the people's fault. It's not the people who hurt you's fault. It's your responsibility to allow the Lord to heal what happened inside of you so you can move past it. So you can step into your destiny. So you can step into your calling. So you can say that I'm fighting not just for me, I'm fighting for the generations that are gonna follow me, but it's up to me to start taking ground. It's up to me to be just like King Josiah and say, we're, we're starting over. It's up to me to say, I'm willing to step out of what's normal and what people say is normal. I'm willing to step out of comfort to say, I'm willing to change and I need it and I desire it. The enemy wants to overwhelm you and say, this is impossible. But I wanna tell you, something that's amazing is the Grand Canyon wasn't created by just some amazing earthquake. It was just steady stream of water that kept going and kept grinding and kept happening to erode and to change the, the whole structure of something. It takes work, but it's just consistent work. Direction, not intention, will determine your destination. Andy Stanley said that, and, and, and it's one of those things where you just say, I want to go to that side of the room, but if I'm walking this way, it's not ever gonna happen. If you want your family to read the word together, then start and be consistent with it. It's a struggle, I know. And sometimes it feels weird, and sometimes you don't know what to say, but start with, Start with one passage. Start with one worship time as a family. Just start. Guys, I, I say this every chance that I get, but 10% more effort growing and discipling your family will make 100% of a difference. It's just the starting. Even if their kids just say, hey, my parents tried really hard, then maybe that's gonna be their normal. But what you're giving them right now is gonna be their normal. Let's close our eyes and let's, let's let the Lord evaluate some things in us. As we're here, maybe we realize we've fallen into the trap of autopilot. We've let, it, we've let life happen to us instead of us happening to life and us bringing God's kingdom to this earth. Maybe you've been seeking stuff for comfort and you've lost who you were created to be. Or today you just said, I, I don't even know where to start, but I'm willing to ask the question of just, Lord, please help me. If any of these things grab your heart and you just say, I, I need it. I need your strength. I need your comfort. And you understand that his comfort isn't circumstantial. His comfort is eternal. If that's you, just say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much, God, for your word of making us evaluate the things that make us comfortable. God, do not let us walk out this door. Do not let us go home. Do not let us do anything the same as what we did before. Let us be molded and shaped by what you have for us. Let us be molded and shaped by your design, by, by your desires for us. God, we are called for more. We're called for more. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. Amen. Guys, do not forget, 
Pastor Todd will be back next week. We are so excited for him to be back. So excited about the word that's gonna be here. It's gonna be timely and it's for us to be able to grow and bring as many people. So please invite somebody, share this post, share it with other people, invite people here because TWC is gonna be doing some amazing things in the near future and we want you to be a part of it. God bless.